the tremendous growth of Christianity in Uganda is one of the major phenomenon of the whole world, Christendom. What we have seen God do in Uganda, Buganda, does not compare with anywhere else. Something happened here, Jesse, which deserves to be told as a great story of the explosion of Christianity. Welcome to the Father State. I'm Jesse Lee Peterson. Thank you so much for being with me. The Father State is now on subscribestar.com. So click on the subscribe star link in the description to support our work. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I absolutely appreciate it. I have with me today a very interesting guest. I have with me Pastor Gabriel Baba. He's also known as Pastor Martin Simpa, and he is the founder and pastor of Makarere Community Church. He is the founder and pastor of Makarere Community Church in Uganda, Uganda. Pastor, thank you for coming on. Hey, it's a pleasure. It is a joy to join you, Jesse. I've had many good things about you and some of my fans have always been saying to me, you got to find a way to get to Jesse's show. And uh, I don't know how it worked out. Here I am on your show, excited. I can't wait to have a discussion with you. Well, thank you. I'm surprised. I didn't know you were familiar with us. That's even better. So thank you very much. So can you pronounce your name for me? Because I know I didn't do well with it. Uh, I have a, a new name and I have an old name, so I'm like in transit. So my <laughs> old name that many <laughs> many people know is Martin Semper. Okay, Martin Semper. That's my old name. But my new name is Gabriel Baba Gwangamuje Iriesu. So Gabriel is fine. Baba is also fine. I know Gwanga yes, is quite long, even for my wife. So yeah, uh, yeah. Gabriel Baba is fine. Game of Baba. Okay. Thank you. Mm. So um, I want to talk a little bit about your upbringing first because I saw a couple of your videos and I believe yeah. you said on one of your videos that you were the last child in the family. You're the youngest and that your mother uh, had you out of well out. She wasn't married and somehow or another it had a, a negative impact on your life or on your surrounding. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, uh, I'm the last born of my mother. She had eight children, and uh, I was born out of wedlock. Uh, what happened, my mother split with my stepfather, and then she met my father, who was an Indian. This was in 1967, uh, 68. And um, when I was conceived, I was conceived out of wedlock. And uh, my father's side, who are Indians, uh, told my mother, who is African, that's a Muganda, that, you know, Indians don't have children with uh, Africans. And so she must have an abortion. And uh, my mother, being a woman of faith, uh, she said no. Uh, she did not uh, go ahead with the pressure to abort me. And... Um, Soon after I was born in 1968, uh, just a couple, one year or two later, Idi Amin, that was the president of uh, Uganda at the time, is a dictator. He threw out all the Indians out. That story is shared in, in, in many different movies. Right. Uh, Mississippi, Masala, and others. So I was born out of wedlock. I survived being aborted. Uh, but uh, I have to say my mother's side really loved me. My African uh, side loved me, even though there was rejection. So even after today, I'm still looking for my father. Uh, I've never met my father up to today. I know that there were Indians who migrated to Canada and uh, England. I'm still searching for my dad. It's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's an emotional thing for me. Yeah. Uh, but... 
but uh, it's a journey. It's a process. I'm now, you know, like a celebrity. Uh, people think everything is okay, but there's still a father hunger. You wonder, yeah. you know, uh, what, what does your dad look like? What would it be like to meet him again? And uh, what about racism, you know? And uh, yeah, all those challenges and, and abortion. So I, I'm glad I wasn't aborted and here I am. Thank yes. you for asking. And so do you have that void within that like, inside of your body it doesn't feel like something's missing and that yearning is for the father it's very true it's very true now that i uh have been a, a parent uh, uh this year this month uh i'm celebrating 30 years of marriage my wife is from uh, uh the bronx the bronx uh, she's born in the bronx new york city uh grew up on long island and uh, we've been working here we've been in uganda we're married 30 years and I've raised uh, three boys and two girls, and I just try to do my best as a dad. But uh, I can't, I, I still have a hunger. You yeah. know, there's something missing. Yeah. There's something missing. Uh, I mean, I don't want my dad's money. Uh, you know, Indians are very good at trading. They're very good at businessmen. No, but I, I, there's still uh, a need to connect to the man who is my father. Yeah. And if, you know, by now, as I calculate the years, if he was about 20, in 1970 now you know it's about what you know 50 years later so he should be about 70 more in the sunset of his life so i, I pray that if if it is possible on this side of heaven to see him <laughs> i really would find it <laughs> yeah. yeah there is a hunger i, I yeah, know there is a me, hunger. and and every man woman and child if they're not raised with their father they do have that hunger for the father it's like something is mm. missing and mm. they think that is material things or, or a job or something else. But it's really is that cry is about a return to the father. It's a hunger for mm. the father. So I totally understand it. And so how old are you right now? I am 54 years old. Oh, OK. Amazing. Well, I hope you hey. I hope you find your father. I hope he shows up out of nowhere. I, I, now that was, I, I probably should start a social media campaign. Help find Gabriel Baba's father. That's right. That's right. That's for sure. It might work too. So, so you live, you live in Uganda, yeah. right? Yes, we do. We live in Uganda. So, how did you end up with a white woman out of the Bronx, New York, in the USA? Uh, what the? I what. I watched the movie Coming to America, and uh, after watching that movie Coming to America, it really inspired me to go to America to find my queen. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I think there is this, uh, uh, when Americans think about Africa, they have the Wakanda uh, ideas of Africa, but, uh, and, and sometimes Hollywood makes, uh, you know, an interesting story. But um, the fact that I married a woman from New York City, the Bronx, uh, grew up in Long Island, is really a story of God. She came over as a short-term missionary after her college. She, Tracy, had gone to Houghton College in upstate New York. And after she finished college, she wanted to do an internship. And she was sent to Uganda. And when she came, uh, she did an internship with my church. I was doing uh, an HIV AIDS education program for young people. So she worked with me. And as we worked together, uh, I wrote a play that was doing AIDS education. At the time, HIV was really, really ravaging uh, East Africa and Africa. And um, I had just um, come to know the Lord Jesus as my savior. Uh, I had grown up Roman Catholic and uh, somewhere in high school, you know, I sort of began to drift away. But uh, in my effort to try uh, and make a girlfriend at a Baptist bookstore, they invited me for a Bible study. And that I met an African-American young man called Brian Pearson, who was from Arkansas. And Brian, you know, he just leveled with me. He was also a student worker. And then um, 
he his friendship really built a bridge for me because it was an intellectual discussion discussing about Africa, discussing about uh, apartheid. Uh, there was still apartheid in South Africa. There was, you know, great interest of Africans to know about the African-American. And that built a bridge because I really like ideas. I really like to know more. Um, then that's how I came to the Lord. Uh, later, you know, he challenged me to do something about HIV AIDS. Then a student worker who came was Tracy. And as we worked together, uh, we ended up falling in love, and uh, I asked her to marry me. And uh, she said yes. And when she said yes, it shook up the whole agency because, you know, um, <laughs> uh, at the time, you know, the, the, the Southern Baptist in, in Uganda, the two churches, the Southern Baptist, the Baptist Southern Baptist, and the conservative Baptist were forced to make a theological truce by Idi Amin. In 1971, when he threw out the Indians, he was about to throw out the Americans, too. And he says, why are you two kinds of Baptists? Well, we are Southern, we are conservative. Well, he says, I give you 24 hours to fix your doctrine. And uh, they, they fixed it quick. And uh, our, our church had both Southern Baptist and conservative Baptist. Uh, the idea of a black... Ugandan marrying a white woman shook us, you know, shook the community up because it, you know, in 1990, it was quite a new idea. Yeah. And uh, so we walked a road, you know, of bringing change in the mission group. Uh, we walked a chain, a road of uh, even my wife's church getting used to an idea of a black man marrying a white woman. We were the first couple to get married in Long Island, New York, in the church. And uh, we have faced racism, but we have also faced acceptance. We have faced, we have seen change. Uh, people that were more conservative, uh, one of the people, you know, I remember one time I, I was in Philadelphia. We went to Philadelphia for graduate school after we got married. And uh, I introduced my wife to one of the school principals and he kept looking for a black woman near me. And <laughs> yeah. I said, no, th th this is the one. This is the one. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> but uh, I've learned, uh, Jesse, I've learned to be gracious. Um, I've, I find some people, uh, you know, easily offended when there is discrimination and racism. Yeah. I'm not, because my, 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 uh, my self-esteem is not snowflakey. I'm, not, I'm a child of a king. So even if you don't put me in the picture or even if maybe you, you don't treat me right, uh, I'm not going to flip out. Yeah. Uh, my self-esteem is built on the solid rock. That's Jesus Christ and his righteousness. So, yeah, we've gone through, but I'm not looking for sympathy yeah. uh, because I've gone through struggle. No, I, I, I will celebrate uh, all the people that have supported us, who have loved us. For, you know, for many, it's a change. You know, it, it, it was a new thing. And uh, one of the missionaries here uh, who was uh, with Conservative Baptist, uh, I remember him, uh, while others, you know, were really not to us, he he called us to his house and gave us coffee, and he says, I'm so excited about you. He was a white you know, missionary from uh, Oregon. He's like, I'm so happy for you. I'm so excited <laughs> for you. This is great. This is great. So not everybody is, you know, no, no, no yeah. race. You know, it's, yeah, you find people that love you. And even when the marriage, we hit some rocks. Again, there's some people who had originally had difficulty with us were the one who governed us and canceled us and helped us to work out, you know, my African culture, my wife from New York, how we navigate the road of, of marriage. Yeah. And uh, here we are 30 years later. Well, yeah. that's amazing. Congratulations. Why did you change your name? Uh, well, that's a tough question, but I will say uh, if, every, if people can change their agenda, why can't I change my name? Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's, for, that's for sure. <laughs> Amazing. I mean, pe people changing their agenda every day. I'm a man. I'm a woman. I'm half this. I'm by spirit. I'm trans that. So anyway, uh, uh, I say if they do, why not me? But my is coming of age. Mine is coming of age. I, um, 
as a, a student and a scholar, I uh, go to a crisis a few years ago where I was really sensing in the spirit that there was bondages on my life, which were very fundamental. And uh, my daughter was having dreams where African spirits were putting her on fire, you know, pouring oil and burning her and telling her, we're punishing you because your dad is not submitting to us. And they said, my name is, you know, they said, I'm Mukasa. You know, Mukasa is the god of the water. So I'm like, who is this Mukasa who is out at war with me? So I said, okay, I, I need to read about this. So about four years ago, I began reading extensively about the gods, the gods of Africa, and the claims and, and, and what they do and the covenants that we made and uh, what the ancestors did in bringing these uh, covenants to us, you know. So one of those is that every child gets a name and the name has a covenant. A co and the name has to do with either a god or heel or something sacred. And so my name, Sempa, was a sacred heel of a god called uh, Sempa who in Bolemezi, and uh, which laid claim that any boy born around there should be called Sempa. I realized that it was incompatible and inconsistent for me to be called the name of another God. Yeah. Because the God that I serve, Jehovah, is a jealous God. He is a God who makes new covenant. Abraham, you know, God told Abraham, you know, you've got to change your name, you know, from Abraham to Abraham. And uh, from then, you know, he, that's when he had his breakthrough. So I got to see, I got to give up the name of the gods. I know, and everybody's like, why are you doing that? You're famous already. This is going to, this is great. I said, well, I thank you what I've done, but I don't want to be known as a servant of the God, African God called Sempa. I want to be known as a servant of Jehovah. So my three name, Gabriel, is I stand in the presence of God. A Baba is the name for father across Africa, because I believe I'm starting a new generation, a new, a new godly generation. And Gwanga Muje Eriyesu is my mission in life. Gwanga Muje is when the Africans are having, uh, uh, you know, anything official, they play a drum. It's a special drum. It's, it, it has a special rhythm. And if you hear it, you know you got to show up, you know. It's called Gwanga Muje Eriesu. So my mission in life is I'm making the drum, I'm making noise, everybody come to Jesus. So that's why I changed my name. That's amazing. So let me ask, you are a Christian, right? Yes, I am. What is the difference between Christianity in Uganda and in America, and Christianity in America, is there a difference? Ha, huh, that's a good question. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. But I, should, I would like to say that uh, uh, Americans have not had the background of ancestral worship that we have had as Africans. So um, you do not have it embedded in your DNA. How uh, many of you are standing on, on two or three or four generation of Christianity. Uh, for us, we are first generation uh, Christians or born again Christian. And that, uh, that experience causes you to assess and to ask, what is it that I brought in into Christianity? So um, the name, uh, when you ask the name, the, you know, for the Africa, the name is very important because you win, the name tells your tribe, the name tells your religion, the name tells us your clan. The name tells us uh, who your father is, uh, you know, which clan he's in. The name for the African is very important. And so when I look at Christianity in America, you know, uh, and Europe, um, I'm very grateful that in the late 1800, early, you know, that's 1880, 1890, uh, the, the missionaries brought the gospel to us. And uh, they preached to us a tremendous sacrifice. And we were savage. I mean, we're primitive. We were primitive. Uh, uh, there's a lot of, you know, talking about uh, the glories of the African 
civilization. Yes, there's good things about this, but it's like uh, the Incas of uh, South America. We used to sacrifice people. The life of a person, you know, was if, if the gods ask for 500 people to be killed every month, they will be rounded up. They will be killed and sacrificed. We didn't, so there were good things, yeah, and there were bad things. Yeah. And Christianity has brought tremendous good things. I saw one of your past guests talking about go, you know, going back to Egypt. And, and, and I see this gap in black America that is trying to reject Christianity because they're re- related to the white man. And in, and in fighting racism, they reject Jesus they reject Jehovah, and they're trying to look for Mukasa. Let me tell you, Mukasa is a capricious God. They demand sacrifice of babies. And in my culture, all the babies who are born twins, they are dedicated to the gods. And the parents of the twins, all the twins have specific names. The twins are not even your children. Their umbilical cords are taken. They are initiated into the spirits. Um, it, it really is not godly. It needs to be transformed. So, yeah, we as African Christians, are, you know, we, we are dealing with stuff that we must give up. But the, um, the church in America, I'm looking at black America, uh, is now hungry for something new from Africa and is going back to the savagery that we used to have. And that's wrong. That's yeah, amazing. There is also the, yeah. That's wrong. And I'm telling, uh, you know, my brothers, don't go back. We yeah. cannot go back to Egypt. I mean, I have faced racism. I get discriminated. But it doesn't, it doesn't mean that I should turn away from Jesus. Yeah. No, there are bad people in every society and good people as well. Yeah. So anyway, I, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, thank you for asking. That's what I wanted to share about that. And so in Uganda today, is there a fight between the black Christians and the, the thing that was happening before Christianity came along? Is there a fight between the two in Gaganda? Uh Well, um, I should say the, the tremendous growth of Christianity in Uganda is one of the major phenomenon of the whole world, Christendom. In fact, the missionaries who came from England, it's called Church Missionary Society, when they were evaluating their entire expenditure and their effort. Uh, they had been in India, they had been in South Africa, Zambia, Zimbabwe, uh, Nigeria, uh, Ghana. When they assessed all their efforts, even from the islands, they said, what we have seen God do in Uganda, Buganda, does not compare with anywhere else. Something happened here, Jesse, which deserves to be told as a great story of the explosion of Christianity. 80% of Ugandans are Christian. Uh, We should have been a Muslim nation. That's a miracle of the missionaries who came because we're just below Egypt, just below Sudan, uh, which is very Sudanic. And then we are caught between uh, Uganda, just below, is, is Tanzania, which is also, you know, heavily influenced by uh, the Islamic religion. But God somehow changed us. Uh, we have very good racial relations in Uganda. I think it's one of the very best. The, the, the relationships between black and white is one of the very best. But now we have some new missionaries who are coming. The new are uh, the pro-gay missionaries, uh, the pro-LGBT missionaries. Those are the ones that are bringing trouble to us because we don't accept their kinds of interpretation of the Bible and uh, the the kind of Bishop Gene Robinson. We debate with them and and their agents, and we say, no, that's not the Christianity we know in the Bible. But um, I think there is a transformation that we do have, um, strongly Pentecostal, strongly Catholic, strongly Episcopalian or Anglican, and uh, that constitutes 80% of the country. That's amazing. So let me ask, yeah. what is the, and I know you lived in America for a minute, I, I believe I saw, what is the difference between Africans, Uganda African blacks, and the United States blacks? What's the difference between the two countries? Um, 
I think one of the things that really helped me to understand black America was living there. When I first came to a black America, going to the churches, the first thing that I noticed was that in every church, uh, there was about seven, you know, 70% were women or 80% were women and 20% were men in the church. Yeah. And that, that really bothered me. That's 1990. That's when I came, 1992. That's when I came to the United States in New York, in Philadelphia, uh, going down Atlanta. I, I began to see a phenomenon, even in colleges, uh, that uh, it's mostly women in co- black, historical black colleges. Um, so I got to ask, and I'm like, what are you guys doing about this issue? This is, this is a problem. In, in Uganda, in Africa, we have about 50-50. We, we got the men in the church. We got the women in the church. How do you bridge this gap? So I see that black America, one of the things that helped me to understand was a book of uh, Justice Book, uh, Slouching Towards Gomorrah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I remember that. He, 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 yeah, great. That was really helpful for me in understanding America, especially on the area of the race relations, when he reviewed the 50 years of the black um, affirmative action yeah. that separated fathers uh, from mothers and uh, has created, I think what I would see as a matriarchal state of black America. So. Uh, when I look at black America and I compare it to Africa, I see what the European and the America is trying to bring. What caused the failure in America, the breakdown of the black family is being put into Africa through gender, through feminism, through the exporting of uh, uh, scholarships that they are sending to us. And, And being an intellectual Being a pastor of a college, uh, one of my duties is to be an academic pastor, is to to question ideas, to contest ideas. And I'm like, well, look, this thing has been in black America for 60 years. The same policies you're trying to bring to us have failed. Uh, Look at the, you know, the the feminization of the black male. Yeah. What we have seen. And uh, that is what they are bringing over as an export to Africa, uh, by large, by and large, the Afri- average African woman is respectful of her culture uh, and tradition. She's she desires to have a family, a husband and a wife. They love to have children. Uh, they are religious, whether they are Christian or Muslim, and uh, their number one issue is not uh, you know the pet causes whether abortion or feminism or alternative lifestyle. That's not, they, their number one issue is to have children. So there is a difference in just that microcosm, the microcosm of the women, of the society. Um, it's very much male. Uh, the men are seen, the boys are seen as well as the girls, but increasingly because of the European American type of thinking, they're exporting what I see has happened to black America, which I'm sure you know very well and, yeah. and you try to change very well. Yes. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, are they, uh, and, and I want to ask you in a minute here about the uh, organization you started, Straight Nation, but let me ask, are they starting to have an impact on changing the cultural and the mindset of the black Ugandans there? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I have just uh, I'm on the final stage of writing a book, uh, <laughs> Africa's Resistance to Euro-American Agenda of Homosexuality. And in researching it, I've taken uh, about it's now about it's coming to eight years. But I see a well organized plan on taking over African society and changing it. And it's very well documented. Uh, They had a conference in South Africa in 2004 where they mapped out in detail how they want to change Africa, the society, uh, the religion, the laws, the culture, and how they they, they want to make what is the, the uh, the culture, but we want to make the minority and they want to bring the new, you know, the modified Christian dome or culture. 
and they've been funding it very well with uh, you know United Nations, with World Bank, and agencies that are international, multinationals. So they have been working on it. One of the things they did was they they gave scholarships to some of our best students, and they brought them, uh, and uh, they brought them to University of Michigan. Uh, university, Harvard University, and they teach them gender courses, gender ideology. That's amazing. And so when they get the very best, then they bring them back. They become one of the professors, um, became the head of the school of law. And she and her husband have been uh, heading the school of law in Uganda. And so you can imagine that from 1990, uh, coming to 2000, that's 10 years, 2000 to 2010, that's 20. 2000 to 2020, that's 30. Now what has happened is that the students who have been indoctrinated have now entered into their magistrates in court, their high level officers, and we have this shift that the older judges, the older magistrates, the, those who are older, have the older mindset of, hey, a man is a man, he's not socially constructed. A woman is a woman, biologically. They're not socially constructed, but we got the new ones. And so I think we have about maybe about seven years if something doesn't change. The second one was our experience with uh, the former president, Barack Obama, who we love very much. We were excited that a black man was now finally in the White House and that he's going to look up for the interests of Africa and Africans. We, I mean, we sell, it was like a messianic <laughs> moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> what a mess. <laughs> what a mess. <laughs> I don't think we've had any president who has messed up Africa yeah. than the former president, Barack Hussein Obama, because he made executive orders that turned the entire United States um, government for one purpose only. And one purpose was the exporting of the culture of sexual deviance. This became, the LGBT became the number one agenda for every American agency. The Department of Commerce, Secretary of State, um, you know, foreign services, every group it made it its point. Now they come to Africa, they're finding this very old conservative African uh, Christian president, and they're like, you gotta, you gotta bring the gay rights here. You gotta bring LGBT. You got, I mean, they're hitting us on the head. I mean, there's no, de there's no debate over here. Uh, they are blackmailing us with uh, removal of funding for hospitals, uh, for health care. It's a mess. It is an absolute mess. What a so, mess. Uh, it, it is a mess. And uh, if uh, I've written it in my, in my book, I'm, I'm on the, hopefully in the, in the next uh, about one month, uh, it will be out. Africa's Resist is Straight Nation Uprising the African story of uh, uh, our resistance to Barack Obama's policies. So that's coming up. I remember when Obama was there, and I remember there was a lot of talk about Uganda resisting his uh, homosexual ideas. They were not going to let that happen over there. So it was a major discussion, and I was happy to see that. Finally, black people stand up for something that's right. You know, so it was nice to see that. You started the straight nation is that's why you started this organization in order to stop this from growing in your country? What was the purpose? Absolutely. Uh, um, I came to uh, Jesse. I came to the when I uh, when I I supported uh, our country resisting the agenda and articulating uh, uh, ideas are ideas. You know they need to be articulated and they need to be. Rejected. So when we rejected that way of life, the LGBT way of life, it's it's a contest. I was persecuted. I was witch hunted. I had to go to the American embassy and renounce my American citizenship. I was American because my wife is American. I had become an American citizen. I was being witch hunted with lawsuits. Lawsuits at the ICC, International Criminal Court, lawsuits in American Federal Court. There was like no end to it. 
So I said, you know what? I, I love being America. I love uh, joining and being part of America, but I was under a lot of duress. Yeah. So I had to go to the embassy and renounce American citizenship. This gives you an idea of the amount of suffering I went through. Just say, I was speaking some of the best churches. I spoke in um, Rick Warren's church several times. I was one of the, the, the best appreciated pastor in um, some of the biggest churches in the United States of America. But I was demonized. I was attacked. I was vilified. You know, when you speak up against this agenda, they, they yeah. throw everything at you yeah. like you would not believe it. So uh, I've gone through a hard time financially. I mean, we were destroyed. If I did not, God did not give me the strength to start financially. All the country, the churches that used to support us stopped supporting us because each one of them was told, hey, uh, they are killing gays in Uganda. Uh, Pastor Semper is killing gays. You are a friend of someone who's killing. None of those is true. None of those, but it doesn't matter. Right. But in this world, once you throw it out and you throw it out and you throw it out, before you know it, uh, somebody says, hey, look, look, look at him. He is the person who is killing gays. I'm like, I'm like what? what? I mean, you end, up just, you end up just keeping quiet. You're like, I don't want to say anything about that. I, I don't want, please leave me alone. But I realize in schools, the kids are being indoctrinated in movies, in books, everywhere. We got to yeah. say something. So in reflecting over it, the, I, I got to see that the only word that the LGBT would accept to have dialogue was straight. And so I, uh, I said, okay, if you call me straight, I will just champion straight. I will explain to you why I am straight, uh, why straight people are contributing to civilization, uh, why we must respond to the many lies that are being told to our children with truth and with respect. And then uh, we must advance the family because if we don't advance the family, I mean, our kids are going to say, no, I, uh, uh, yeah. you know, sometimes girl, girls don't like to boys, you know, uh, developmentally. I remember time I had no use for girls, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I was just like boys. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah. So let me ask, I, did uh, uh, yeah. Pastor Juan and churches like that, did they turn against you as well? Oh, yeah. My goodness. Rick Warren was number one because he was, uh, you know, attacked. He didn't talk to me at all. He wrote, he sent us a video, told us, don't resist the gay agenda. Uh, you just, you know, just be nice. I'm like, really? Rick, what is this? What wow. is this? Yeah. And uh, we had such, you know, we had a fall. I almost burnt Rick Warren's, you know, purpose driven book because I bought I bought about 20,000 of his books for my university where I am. But we were so disappointed with his lack of courage to stand. We, we, I mean, guys were like, let's burn his books. I'm like, no, don't burn them. Don't burn them. <laughs> he, he, he wrote good things, but when the, we know, when the rubber hit the road, he just wasn't able to stand strong. And what? I think that's what... We, we, we need to, tr you know, we need to encourage our pastor. We need to encourage our thought leaders. Stand strong. Stand strong. Why do you think uh, uh, pastors like Rick Warren and others are afraid to stand up against the homosexual agenda, this idea of racism agenda? They seem to be afraid to deal with those real issues in life. Why do you think they are afraid? Huh. Uh... If I would, uh, if I would dare to, I think the love, you know, to, to be, to, to be thought as well, uh, to, uh, I probably would say they need more Jesus for, for real. They need more, just say, they need more Jesus. You know, Jesus got to go from, you know, looking good on the outside because this, Jesus says in this world, you will have tribulation. Yeah. You will suffer. Yeah. You will be persecuted. They, I, I really think they choose because this was in real time. Rick Warren rejected me and he reached out to Elton John and said, if me and Elton John kiss, it will be a kiss that goes around the world. And Sempa, get behind the bus. Dude, dude, what's wrong? 
<laughs> I swear. I mean, Rick, Rick Warren. Look, you can't choose Elton John over me. I know Elton John is got glad. You know, he's got money and he's popular and everything. Yeah. He can sing all right. But I'm a brother in the Lord. Yeah. So even if even if I'm being persecuted, we need to stand with each other through the hard time. That's I think right. they just need they need they need more Jesus in there. That's what I would say. Do you think it's possible to be called by God? Because these people claim to be called by God to be preachers and pastors and bishops. Do you think it's possible to be called by God and be afraid of the devil? Because that's what they're afraid of. They're afraid of the devil. Do you think that it's possible to be called by God and be afraid to deal with the devil? Bro, you have hit the right place. Just as me, when the devil visited me, my home, and he began giving images, he's going to burn my house down. I said, no, we're going to fight. Yeah. We are going to fight. And I began a campaign that made sure things change in my life, Think, even up to my name. Now, I think uh, people like Rick Warren, they need to choose. They need to choose Jesus. They need to choose to be friends of fellow Christians, but they need to increase their prayer because the devil is moving, the devil is working, the devil is going to intimidate you, and if your prayer temperature is short, you're going to be blown over. I have to pray, Jesse, I have to pray at least one hour every day yeah. just to keep things going. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. every, de every demon is sent against me. Yeah, okay? I, I mean, I mean, I did, like number one, uh, if you, every demon is sent against because they identify, uh, I just, I'll tell you why. If I was pro LGBT, I would be the most loved black <laughs> African in the USA. Yeah. There'd be, I was, I was at the U S Congress because my work in HIV AIDS was very successful. We were able to turn the country around. We were able to stop the high incidence of HIV and brought it down. So I was world famous. I was a black man who married a white woman. Look, I got everything that they should want. We, we have dealt with racism. I have, I have brought reconciliation between a white New Yorker and a black African from Wakanda. We lived for 30 years and we're still together. We have worked in HIV AIDS and helped people to overcome that. And thousands of lives have been changed and it's documented. But because we were able to stand for what God says, that marriage is man and woman. Yeah. And, and we must continue civilization according to God's command. We had to be destroyed. And look, I would rather any day uh, people attack me for standing for what's right than to be promoted for standing what's wrong. Absolutely. So let me ask you, there's so many things I have for you. And I'm looking at the clock here. Um, most black people were stunned to know that Barack Obama's number one agenda was homosexuality and LBGT and all that mess. He was pushing that. Why do you think that was Obama's number one agenda? It seemed to be his number one agenda. Why was he so into pushing that? Uh, <laughs> the things about Barack Obama, were, which he told us he was evolving, if you do recall in this book, Audacity of Hope, uh, he talks about how, uh, I think so, Audacity of, he talked how he evolved on gay marriage. Yeah. He used to say, no, I don't believe in gay marriage. Uh, we must, uh, at least uh, we, we, we must accept, no, marriage should be kept man and woman. But all the time, he was pushing that agenda, which is now being continued today, by the president, the current uh, establishment of uh, President Biden. So um, I think Barack, there was more than met the eye. I think Barack used his blackness. Barack used his blackness and the sympathy that we as Africans have for the suffering of black Americans, having gone through slavery, having gone through racism, having gone through you know, discrimination, and that was used to get us sympathy, and he should have led us to Bethlehem, but he did not. 
Barak didn't lead us to Bethlehem. Barak led us to Gomorrah. Yeah. In fact, that, that, that yeah, he that, that I like that the poem here of uh, of uh, I like the poem of um, in the book uh, by Justice Book. He quotes William Butler and he says, "And what rough beast? It's our come around at last." slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. Well, this beast, uh, I talk about the beast of uh, Barak's uh, vision that was slouching towards Africa. Every time he opened his mouth, this was it. In fact, he put up a scholarship called Mandela Scholars, where he provides scholarships for about 500 young Africans. And he brings them to America. I will tell you, I've, I've reviewed the curriculum. Then even in the application form, from the place where it is, it's all an indoctrination into the LGBT mind style. So it's a, it's a mindset change that Barack used his blackness to download onto the African, the LGBT. And he made, uh, in 2012, he made executive orders. These executive orders were commanding all departments of the, go the government of the United States to put as number one priority the expansion of LGBT rights around the world. It wasn't about dealing with black people. It wasn't about hunger. It wasn't about HIV. It w the number one issue that he made a priority as a central locus of his foreign policy was LGBT. We're still reeling from that. And if I would have a chance to speak to Barack Obama, I would say, Barack, we love you, but we don't love that mind, that lifestyle. It's not for black people. It, it's not for <laughs> us. It's like, trying, no, it's not for us. No, 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 no. <laughs> Africans, uh, Jesse, let me tell you, the African by culture were very much aware of the ancestors and the descendants. The living is a bridge between the past, that's the ancestors, and the future, that's the descendants. I have a duty as an African man or woman to produce children so that there will be continuity yeah. of what God started from our fathers to the sons, to the grandsons, to the great-grandsons. Any man who dies without children in Africa uh, really, I mean, it can be because of biological issue, but it's a, such a cause of distress. We think it's an affront, affront to God. If you could, uh, if you could have children, chose not to have children, it's an affront to the to the to the ancestors and to the living. That's amazing. So let me ask, in short, what type of government do you have in Uganda right now? We have a republic government where we have a president. That's elected, uh, and then we have a parliament. It's British style, where they make laws in the parliament, and then um, we do have cabinet ministers. Uh, it's an African, it's an you know an African republic. And so are they but, con uh, are they conservative or liberal? Most of them are conservative. In fact, when they signed the bill against uh, homosexuality back in 2014, it was you know bipartisan. It was opposition and pro-government. Everybody was together. But I have to say that since then, a lot of money is being powered out, Jesse. A lot of money is being powered out in Uganda, in Afri sub saharan Africa, for one purpose only, to effect a, re a cultural regime change. And I, uh, in my book, I write that uh, if they fail to change it culturally, uh, they will, you know, they, they, they pull stunts like what happened in South Africa. In South Africa, at the, rewrite, you know, at the end of apartheid, there was an opportunity to rewrite the constitution. And in rewriting the constitution, they had some sharp Dutch lawyer in, you know, put in some, some words of sexual orientation. Don't discriminate because of sexual orientation. And they kept quiet. And a few years later, then they got a judge, uh, someone prosecuted, and then they said, oh, no, you must, you must legalize uh, LGBT rights in South Africa. And then culturally, people were not ready. People didn't want it. They said, let's have a referendum. They said, no, no referendum. And uh, it became a hostage that judges thwarted the will of the people something that we've seen play out in California, something we've seen play out in America, where a few individuals strategically positioned, they decide to impose what they want 
against the will of the people. Pray Absolutely. for Africa. Yeah, pray for Africa. And, uh, but, but this dialogue is very important because the acceptable black Africa now, the one they will want you to hear, is not like me. We are the undesirable Negro. I'm sorry to use the word Negro. There is the, uh, there's, the, de there's the desirable Negro and this undesirable Negro. The, the undesirable Negro is like you and like me. They don't like us. <laughs> yeah. But the, the one they like, they will, get, they will get the ones they want. Those are the ones who have the colors, you know, the, the rainbow colors. That's a desirable Negro. That one they, they will get. And they will even make movies. I believe we have, a, I think uh, there's a movie coming out on one of the civil rights leaders who was promoting LGBT rights. I'm aware of that. That's coming out. Isn't that right? I'm not familiar with I'm not aware of it at this time. Uh, oh, it's, it's, it's coming up. I, I, I wouldn't know be surprised Netflix. if it is. I wouldn't be surprised. I know Netflix has been working very strongly and it's going to be releasing that film. And I, uh, uh, I will, they want to take the civil rights movement. And, and this is what's wrong, Jesse. It's taking the cause of the emancipation of the African and flip it around. So that instead of helping us come out of racism, come out of discrimination, come out of uh, colonialism, coming out of taking over our countries by be, being turned into uh, you know, places to produce resources for the Europeans and the Americans, uh, that moment is being stolen from us as it was stolen from South Africa. Today, South Africa should be a beacon of light. But what happened, it went into the rainbow, and today South Africa is the capi world capital of rape, world capital of HIV, world capital of carjackings, world capital of mugging. People are scared to move in South Africa. We don't want to lose a black revolution. We must contest for it so it's not hijacked by another revolution. That's amazing. I... Um I, I, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but I don't believe racism exists and it never has existed. Our, our mm. battle is a spiritual battle. It's a warfare between good and evil, right versus wrong. We wrestle mm. not against flesh and blood, but against spirits and principalities and wickedness. Mm. And I think one of the ways that these people are able to win, if, you, if, if I should say, this idea of racism and LGBT and all that, they have taken the, uh, what's really going on, and they call it something that is not. It's not racism. It's either right or wrong, good or evil. Yes. It, and yeah. so they have replaced it, and people are being deceived mm. by words. Mm. And so mm. a lot of people believe that racism is this because of the word of it. And then they give you extreme cases and say, look what happened. Black people drag down the road and blah, blah, blah. And you get emotional involved in that. You start to believe that racism exists and you forget that it's a spiritual battle. It's a right or wrong, good or evil thing. And, and Christians are supposed to know that. And when the children of the devil try to tell you that it's about racism, you say, no, it's about good or evil, right versus wrong. What do you think of that? Mm. Well, I, I appreciate you sharing that. As I spoke at the beginning, that uh, there were when I married a white woman, there were those who, are, who found it different. It, it's unusual. Yeah. And indeed, it was unusual. Yeah. Uh, there, were, there were those who opposed it because of fear. Uh, and then there were those who supported it. These are all white people. There are those who supported it. The, uh, Professor Jack Smith, who I talked about, who says, this is great. I'm so proud of you. This is the best thing. I, I talked to you about people in New York, some who would find that because they use that a black man marries a black woman and they were not used to that. And yeah. that's my mindset. So I, I, I appreciate what you said. Uh, in fact, I find the same thing in the gender discourse where they talk about the patriarchy, where they, they refer as if there is men who gather somewhere and they all organize, let's all oppress women. Yeah. And there is nothing like that. There is yeah. no group of men that gather somewhere to come up with a work plan to oppress women. Absolutely. In the same way, there is no place where you have a, a collective group of all the white people gathering together, <laughs> let's oppress black people. It's right. not there. That's but right. you, have iso you have isolated groups of people or individuals 
who do bad things. Yes. And when those are extrapolated by those who want to create wars, wars between black and white, wars between men and women, wars between Africans and European, wars between uh, that, that ridiculous, you know, they, they simplify uh, in the to the basic something that's that's not simple it's complex yes. that there is oh, this this person is falling this person is like this but they they try to make simple something that is not simple it is the fallen sinful mind there is black we have had black people that are bad yeah i mean idi amin idi amin was not a you know wasn't the easy goal we have many president we have politicians who are dictators we have people who are bad and yeah. they're black okay they're black <laughs> like <That's> me <right. laughs> even, <laughs> and we have white people too who are black i mean we're bad and yeah. white people are good yeah so I got to heat this interview up. I got to put you on the hot seat. We're running out of time here. So what I need is for you to answer these questions as quickly as possible. Boom. The hot seat. Uh, what is a man? A man is a man with XY chromosomes. A man looks like me. He's got a beard. A man marries a woman. A man is able to reproduce. Man has a penis. He's able to have penetrative sex with a woman. A man has a voice that gets bigger. A man, as he grows older, it has a prostate. Okay, like now I'm fifty something. I must care about my prostate. Okay, that's a man. A woman doesn't have a prostate. That's right. Are you the head of your wife? Yes, I am the head of my home because Jesus Christ gave a command. The, the husband is the head of the wife. Yeah. This is in terms of the roles that we play in our home. Do you Not love, that I am superior. Go ahead. Do you love white people? Not that I'm superior, but... We, Yes, I do. I love white people. I, my wife is white. I sleep with white. <laughs> I'm in bed with white people. <laughs> uh, pancakes or waffles? Waffles. Do you break dance? <laughs> no answer. I just show you. That's me. <laughs> do you support affirmative action? No. Everybody should be in terms of Everybody should be promoted because of merit. Yeah. I believe if you, if you can fly the plane, you fly. Don't don't fly because you're black. That's right. Do you support? Uh, I mean, I'm sorry. Would you ever vote for an atheist? Oh no, I don't want to vote an atheist. I want to vote a believer. Where all the believers are. That's right. In one word, describe Camilla Harris. Ah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think she's blonde. That's all. <laughs> if if heaven exists, will you go there when you die? Yes, I will, because I trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. Capitalism or socialism? Capitalism. Let every man own his property. Let every man build his wealth and hand it over to his children. Absolutely. Do you um, do you love the Great White Hope? The Great White Hope. What's that? I, I don't know. <laughs> I knew you. What's the Great White Hope? I knew you What's would that? ask. I knew you would ask. I don't frankly yeah. have time for total political correctness. And this country doesn't have time either. This is the great white hope, Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I really appreciate Donald Trump's boldness. I appreciate his economic policies, but he never did anything about the LGBT. He just sort of did not put in, but that is, was his great falling down. He, he should have he should have had the courage to stop those policies that have been put in by Barack Obama. He didn't have the courage to deal with them. I, I, I pray that he will find it. I pray for him. But I appreciate all that he did. Do you support voter ID laws? Yes. I mean, let's identify. Identify yourself. Yeah. Show me your ID. 
Last, uh, should China pay reparations for the uh, Chinese virus? I want to be part of the class action suit <laughs> if there is one. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you for taking on the hot seat. <laughs> Tell the folks how, about how they can get in contact with you, your book that you're writing, or whatever information you yeah. want to give out. Yeah, uh, I really appreciate it. I want to invite all those who are watching, who are interested to visit Africa, uh, send, you know, whether you or your sons and your daughters, I'd love to host you. We do have a, a, a great community, a place where you can be able to stay. So we're putting up a straight nation city where you can be able to come. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Martin Semper. Uh, that is uh, Martin Sem Semper. Uh, that's my Twitter account. My Facebook was shut down uh, because lack of free of sp freedom of speech. Uh, Zuckerberg shut down my Facebook. I hope that uh, after after uh, Elon Musk deals with Twitter, let him go straight to Facebook so we can have some more freedom around. That's right. That's right. I agree. So, uh, my book will be coming out in a couple of weeks. Um, my T-shirt, Straight Nation, is available. Anyone who's seeking to host me, Twitter is the best way to reach, reach, reach out to me. Yeah, and I'm on WhatsApp. My number is uh, plus 256-772-641028. Nice. And it's Martin S-S-E-M-P-A. S S yes. E M P A. Thank you so much for coming on. It was an amazing conversation. I absolutely appreciate it. And I wish you well over there, what you're doing. Somebody got to stand for what is right. God bless you, all right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank all you, right. Jesse. I hope you can visit Uganda sometime. I would love to. I hope it happens. All okay. right, folks. Well, thank Bye -bye. you all for tuning in. I absolutely appreciate it. Don't forget that the Fall Estate is on Subscribe Star now. And so click on the link to Subscribe Star. Uh, click it. Click the Subscribe Star link in the description to support our work. Let me hear from you. Ring the bell. Follow, tweet, visit the store, and all that good stuff. Thank you for tuning in. Have a good one. to call Rick Warren so he can watch that show. <laughs> I will. I will. Thank you, buddy. Right, bye bye. Bye now.